Hello, everyone, and good morning. I'm Abigail Karen, and I'm going to be presenting some work I did with David Gold, Greg Fournier, and Roger Summons, entitled Molecular Data Suggests Sterile Biosynthesis Evolved Around the Great Oxidation Event. And first, I'm going to give you some background so you can understand why you should care about this. First thing you need to know is what is a sterile? Sterols are some lipid molecules. They're organic. Uh, they have these four rings and a side chain group that varies depending on what specific sterile it is. This one here, ergosterol, is a component of the cell membrane in fungi. A uh, sterile you might know is cholesterol, often we talked about. Uh, sterols in general are created by most eukaryotic lineages and only a very small number of bacteria. Um, as such, they're indicative usually of presence of eukaryotes. Furthermore, Sterols require oxygen to be synthesized in this first step, and also further downstream, depending on what specific sterile they're going to end up making. Uh, so the presence of sterols is indicative of aerobic metabolism, because it requires oxygen, and of eukaryotes. So trying to date when sterile synthesis first evolved is an interesting, has impl interesting implications for early life. So trying to date it. So far, people can look at sterols in the rock record. They're preserved as sterines, keeping their carbon backbone, but losing some details like functional groups. Uh, however, the record is currently controversial. Back in 1999, sterols were reported at 2.7 in, sorry, 2.7 billion year old rocks in Australia, which was super interesting because, as you might know, the great oxidation event didn't occur until 2.4 billion years ago, and that's the first accumulation of molecular oxygen in the atmosphere. So having these earlier than the Great Oxidation event was a big deal because oxidative metabolism before we have appreciable oxygen. However, that was recently in the last few years refuted. Those rocks don't actually have sterines preserved in them. And the next closest ones that we're sure of in the rock record are at 1.6 for simple 23 to 24 carbon sterols and 800 million years ago for complex sterines with 26 to 30 carbons, which are generally the ones that all modern eukaryotes create. So there's some debate as to when this pathway evolved. And looking at the rock record isn't currently helping. So we decided to take an alternative approach and look at the genes of modern organisms to try and figure out when this, approach, <laughs> when this pathway evolved just from the genetic record. As such, the first thing we had to do was pick two genes to study. And we decided to pick the first two genes in the sterile synthesis pathway, um, simply because these are conserved across all sterile synthesis pathways, and some of the later genes are not. Um, the first that I'm going to be talking about is squalene monooxygenase that converts squalene to squalene epoxide. And the second gene I'll be talking about is oxidosalt squalene cyclase, which turns this epoxide into a protosterol, such as cycloorganol. And now I'm going to briefly and quickly go through uh, molecular clocks and how they work, um, just because I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with them. So the first thing we do is we acquire amino acid sequences from modern organisms, a uh, whole bunch of them, and we run them through a program that deals with like insertions and deletions and make sure that similar parts are lined up for each gene, uh, just so that they're comparable. We run that through some other programs to create phylogenetic trees using Bayesian or maximum likelihood methods. And the trees that are produced have similar sequences close together and very different sequences just further apart in the tree with longer branch lengths. However, that still doesn't give us any dates. To add dates, we need to add paleontological data, fossils. Um, to do that, you can constrain specific nodes with specific fossils. For example, the mammal-reptile split had to happen before the first solid reptile fossil. So we can calibrate all of these amniotes with hylanomus and give it a date that is earliest and like some probability for when that node occurred. Um, we do this for a whole bunch of nodes, and it creates a molecular clock, which is basically just a phylogenetic tree with dates associated with each node and some probability there. So we started doing this process for SQMO and for OSC. And these are two maximum likelihood trees, SQMO and OSC. Um, this is a representative sampling of eukaryotes and every single bacterial sequence we could find. 
So the bacteria are this dark blue. Um, we only found 27 different species uh, across six different phyla. So it was like, it's real weird bacteria that have these genes. And they correlate both in both gene trees to these two groups, one basal to the eukaryotes and one like inside the eukaryotes. So when you look at this, what I want you to get from this is that all of these non-dark blue things are eukaryotes and they generally reflect the species tree. So we can say that these genes were probably present here in the stem eukaryote and were just vertically inherited throughout eukarya. However, the bacteria are weird. Here, like this group here, bacterial group two, bacteria didn't evolve from algae. So they got this gene through horizontal gene transfer, probably from some algae at some point. Same with this, this basal group. There's horizontal gene transfer here between these bacteria and the stem eukaryote. We can't polarize which direction it is. I can't say, oh, it evolved in eukaryotes, but there was some sort of gene sharing here. So we can say by this node, we had functional SQMO and OSC. Um, also, some of these bacteria have been proven in the lab to actually create functional sterols. So that was like a lot, but basically you just need to know there's two horizontal gene transfers into or out of bacteria. And we think since they're, this, they're in the same place that they were being transferred together. So we looked at the genome of all of these bacteria that have both genes. And if you look, OSC is orange, SQMO is blue, and they're always right about next to each other on the genome of these bacteria, which is pretty good evidence that the two genes were being transferred together in both of these events. And that when we make our clocks, if we're just looking at the transfers, we can add data from SQMO to data from OSC to constrain those two nodes. Um, we ended up doing 10 different analyses, um, looking at two different topologies. Uh, simply because there's some debate if excavates are basal to the other eukaryotes or if they're sister to the bicons. Um, and just to cover all our bases, we did both topologies. We also looked at five different data sets. Uh, the SQMO and OSC genes concatenated, like I just mentioned, because they were being moved together. Also SQMO by itself, SQMO constrained by an outgroup of genes from the ubiquinone biosynthesis pathway. OSC by itself, and OSC constrained by an outgroup of squalene hopine cyclase. It's sort of bacterial analog. Um, each analysis had between 14 and 18 fossil calibrations added. And <laughs> I have to mention that we did exclude the SQMO alone data set from our numerical analyses that I'll get into later, simply because it was broadly inconsistent with our other analyses, broadly inconsistent with previous molecular clock work, and very, very old. Um, but when we added a constraining out group or the data from OSC, it fixed the problem. So here's an example of one of our molecular clocks. This is the concatenated one so that I could particularly look at the two bacterial transfers. Um, first, I want to talk about this green star that's representing crown eukarya. All of the eukaryotes here do make modern, at least the modern versions create 26 to 30 sterols, 30 carbon sterols. As such, we can infer that way back here, we had the genetic machinery to do so. So we'd expect to see 26 to 30 carbon sterols in the rock record around here. Um, but the average date we get for that node is 1.6 billion years ago, which is much earlier than that 800 million I mentioned earlier. Furthermore, if you look at this red node, that represents the first transfer between the bacteria and the stem eukaryotes. So the pathway existed by then, and we should expect to see at least protosterols by this node. Um, as you can probably tell, this 95% confidence interval is really big. It's like 800 million years. So I can't really say that much about when this occurred, but the confidence interval in none of our analyses enters the mesoproterozoic, so we can at least conclude that from this work, these two genes should exist before the mesoproterozoic. And if we look more closely at that node, which is here, the maximum probability in all of the analyses, excluding that SQMO alone one, the light blue, occur like right during or right after the great oxidation event, which is reasonable because the pathway requires oxygen. So sharing it right about then would be 
useful, I guess. Um, so that's about it in conclusion. The pathway, the, the sterile synthesis pathway seems to have evolved much earlier than the rock record suggests. If you look at this little chart, the horizontal lines are our predictions and the vertical lines are the first thing we've found in the rock record. Um, other things of note, the evolution of the pathway correlates with the great oxidation event. So as soon as we have oxygen, we're making these sterols. And a sterile biosynthesis predates the evolution of crown group eukarya and might have been an important pre-adaptation for subsequent eukaryal radiation. And that's about it. I'd like to acknowledge specifically David Gold, who was my mentor on this project, and the Summons and Fournier Labs. Questions for Abigail. Great talk. Um, so it, it seems reasonable that the you know bio, biosynthetic pathway involving oxygen kind of came about around the great oxidation event. Um, but do you think there might have been like a different pathway that was still making uh, you know sterols prior to oxidation that would not necessarily look very similar? Um. I'm not entirely sure. I sort of doubt it because at least the, the cyclase involved is very similar to squalene hopine cyclase. And hopines are, serve a very similar function but in bacteria. And so at least when I do the trees, it looks pretty clear that that gene sort of branched off around then from this hopine gene. Um, I guess there could have been an entirely different pathway, but I have no way to yeah, it's hard to tell with this method, I guess. I, I don't think it's very likely that some other pathway also created sterols, but okay. it could. Mm. Any more questions? Um, so being unfamiliar with the molecular clock method, what's the uncertainty in this sort of analysis? In this analysis? I mean, so we have a different amount of uncertainty on each of the nodes, which are these, it's kind of hard to see, but like these bars. Um, so we have particularly large uncertainties because this clock is only being run with one gene or in this case, two genes of information. And like most published clocks that are just trying to determine the species tree are run with like tens of genes all concatenated together. So we do have more uncertainty than a clock that was just looking at the species tree. But like I said, our conclusions are so broad that I think it's fine. Like we're not saying this definitely occurred at this date. Our conclusion is like this occurred, you know, 600 million years earlier than the rocks. So I think our conclusions are solid, but there's still a lot of uncertainty in the exact dates. Okay, thanks. Does that answer it? <laughs> I think we have time for one more quick question. How conserved are these genes? So how many mutations are you trying to make this molecular clock with? They're fairly well conserved. Um, I don't think I have like a good quantitative answer for you. Uh, I was just looking for the yeah, gene. The tree in general <laughs> has an, like the genes have enough variety that we do just get the eukaryal species tree pretty reliably. So I think we can be fairly confident that what we're seeing is real, but they are fairly conserved. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's thank our speaker again.